My ambition here today is to address the two first points uh, on the slide here, and I hope that I will be able to at least introduce the third point, which is relevant to the last question we just discussed here. Um, and uh, uh, I do that from the perspective of the Swedish Cancer Society, which is an, uh, uh, an organization, for a non-profit organization without any government support. Our basic idea is to beat cancer and to do that by uh, improving knowledge about cancer, mainly through research, but also the implementation of that research. Uh, just before we start on the first uh, area, uh, let me remind you that from the point of view of EU, and this slide was given to me by the previous chairperson in 2013 when I started, uh, this was how it looked from an EU perspective with regards to five-year survival. And this is just to remind you that there are certain cancers that are uh, easier to treat than others. Uh, and this is mainly something that has been accomplished through research. Uh, this is the mission accomplished, and this is what is left to do on the to-do list. And the question is, are we funding research which will enable us to uh, make the green area larger and the red area smaller? It looks like a tremendous challenge. I'm, however, very optimistic. I think you should remind yourself that the green area was much, much smaller. Even when I started studying medicine 40 years ago, uh, it has uh, grown quite significantly. So, um, one more thing before we start on the first area uh, about uh, global cancer research. If you rank uh, cancer research uh, on the basis of countries, you can see that uh, uh, and by bibliometry, meaning the most citations. You can see that the global cancer research is really performed in three corridors in North America, Western Europe and East Asia, Australia. This is when you aggregate by country and do it by citations. But of course, there are excellent cancer research centers in the other areas, uh, uh, but as on the whole, uh, if you do it by country, it looks like this. And that will, of course, influence what type of research is done. If you're asking about trends on this, you can say that the most remarkable trend during the last 15 years is the development in China. China is number four on this list, which was compiled a few years ago. If you do the statistics today, China is number two. 15 years ago, China was not even on the top 20 lists. So there's a tremendous development in China. Uh, in terms of volume of science, some of that is excellent science, but on the average it has a lower innovation grade than uh, in other countries. But I guess in five, ten years this will not be so. So pretty much what will be done in the next decade is really determined how the, by the development in China. Incidentally, Sweden is number 15 on this list, and you can ask, is that good or bad? We are number 90 when we rank according to population, and number 26 when we rank according to BNP. Uh, is 16, is that good? Uh, maybe we should just sit down and uh, instead read all the research that is done in other countries, because we are a small country. But of course, what you must argue is that we rank and do this comparison not because uh, some stupid competition between countries, but we want to know whether we as a country are contributing uh, according to our economic resources, we are richer than most other countries, and according to our academic, historical, uh, cultural, political traditions. We should contribute to uh, world cancer research. It's a global uh, endeavor. So, uh, uh, now starting on what do we spend the money on, and I choose to start by this diagram, circular diagram from 2010, because that was the last year when we had a rather, after a rather stable development. And this is how we spend the money in the Swedish Cancer Society, but it looks pretty similar if you go on other charities in other countries. It's identical in Norway, for example, and for the American Cancer Society, it's about the same. And you can see that most of the money spent on basic cancer research in 2010, a fair proportion on clinical research, small proportion on translational research, going from basic to clinic, and then you have epidemiology and care science. But after this, uh, there was a specific uh, development where translational research has taken over much more, and it has, uh, the basic research has decreased, the clinical research has decreased, and that is because more 
more and more is labeled translational research. Of course, these statistics are based on what the researchers themselves say that they are doing, but it's not just that they put the etiquette translational research just to show that they know the latest term. It is actually a transition, I think, because more and more basic cancer researchers try to take their favorite molecules and uh, cell biological pathways into uh, some kind of treatment or usage for uh, screening or so. And many clinical researchers use collaborations with preclinical scientists using the latest techniques. So I think it's a fair uh, uh, illustration that cancer research is changing. More and more is translational research. You could worry about care research, which has, uh, being where you have from 4 to 2 percent. I'm not so worried, really. I think there's a lot of excellent care research going on, but more and more of that is integrated in the clinical research. Previously, uh, people who used to do care research, they would do it uh, only from their own perspective. Now it's much more common that clinicians include, include life quality assessment in their normal clinical program. So I think uh, I'm not so worried about that aspect. You can, of course, uh, do statistics in many other ways. I won't have time to do that, but we can address what was just discussed in the end before here. How much of this is research uh, addressing prevention? And for us, it's about 8% that addresses prevention. And that is about the same that the American Cancer Society do. And that is both primary and secondary prevention. What are, is the money going to? And for those of you who are researchers, I don't have to explain this slide, but uh, we know now that there is not one secret, one conundrum of cancer. We know that cancer is a phenotype, which is the combination of a certain number of hallmarks. It can be three, five, eight of those. Uh, it's the capacity of cells to construct to continuously stimulate their cell division. It's the deficiency of the brakes that should stop the cell division. It's the inability to answer to signals that telling, tell the cells that they should die, etc. And uh, we know that there are many pathways affecting each of these ha hallmarks, and the uh, cancer can arise by different effects in each of these different pathways. Indeed, uh, uh, Bob Weinberg, who is one of the fathers of these hallmarks of cancer concept, has said there are more ways for a cell to become a cancer cell than there are stars in the sky. And that may sound as bad news, but it's good news if you can actually uh, develop techniques to trace which are the most common changes, to diagnose these in patients and perhaps develop targeted treatments against them. The enabling factors are the, the squares here, tumor-promoting inflammation and changes in genes that you can inherit or that can develop in your life. And of course, then we're speaking about etiology. And uh, as it was said in the beginning here uh, in the introduction, uh, we know that about perhaps 40% of cancers are uh, caused by known factors, inheritance, environment and lifestyle. Uh, but. Uh, 60% we cannot account for, and probably the bad news there is that it's just bad luck, because you accumulate mutations, DNA is inherently unstable, so some of us would just get cancer, although we uh, don't eat too much, don't drink too much, do not smoke, etc., etc. And that's a rather important thing to explain to the public, uh, this paradigm, because we are, all of us are used to think that you get sick if you do something wrong, or if, you're, or if you have the wrong genes, or if you uh, work in some place where there is, or is pollution, but actually you can become sick just because of bad luck, actually. And that means that we cannot only focus our research on preventive measures, we have to develop uh, new things for diagnosis and treatment. Uh, so, uh, uh, all of the researchers here know exactly what this means here. For those of you who are not, modern cancer research is occupied by looking in the tumor, on the green cancer cells, how they interact with a lot of other cells in the microenvironment, different cells depicted here. Some of them are in the immune system, some of them can promote cancer development, some of them can prevent it. The cancer releases things into the circulation, cancer cells which can spread, but also small little bubbles uh, which contain interesting material from the cancer cells. They release DNA, and all of these things you can measure in the blood, one type of liquid biopsy, and you can use that perhaps to diagnose cancer earlier and monitor treatment. Those are examples of what is being done in modern cancer research. 
This is an, uh, you can skip this one. This is another way of depicting it with the professional terms. And you can see here that I've arranged these hot areas according to very modern techniques here, up, which are projecting onto basic research, how to develop and test hypotheses about how cancer develops, but also to develop sc new screening on the top right there, and to develop uh, things for prevention or biomarkers that you can use to follow treatment. And uh, then we come to the treatment on the lower right, uh, where I've listed some hot areas. I should just mention that I come from a symposium in Stockholm, a Nobel symposium on immunotherapy, an extremely exciting development where uh, you, have, you have several breakthroughs with immunotherapy, which should be possible to apply globally, and uh, a lot of new exciting combinations where you combine different immunotherapies or immunotherapy with conventional treatments make me very optimistic for the next uh, decade, actually. More importantly, what are we lacking? In my personal opinion is that we're lacking a couple of things here. Uh, research where we really implement what we, the knowledge to actually make sure that it's used in the whole population, nationally and globally, for prevention. I think we need more research on nutrition. Clinical science in general is underexplored, I think. Uh, and I base that on the knowledge that we have in Sweden, a lot of competence to uh, uh, develop clinical science, but this is not explored properly because the healthcare organization is not prepared for it. We could do, be much better there, and I think that's true for many other countries also. Radiotherapy has been a very strong uh, factor in Swedish cancer research. It still is, but it's mainly technical and oriented towards making more precise radiotherapy with the, by combining with imaging. I think there is an underexplored area here where radiotherapists should be discussing much more with basic biologists, for example, immunologists. More and more people live uh, after having been cured or with a chronic cancer diagnosis. I think we need much more research on rehabilitation. And we also need, uh, and that is the second point I'm going to make, uh, we need to look at what types of cancer we're we supporting. So this is the top 12 list on the left, and the next, number 30 to 22, in terms of how much funding we give out. And you can see that there are big differences here. Is the distribution good? Well, you can ask how many of the ones on the left are on the 12, top 12 list for mortality. Six of them are, so that's appropriate, I guess. Uh, six, the others are not, so they should probably be not, well, I'm not going to say overfunded, but we don't need to sp stimulate specifically research there. But here you have a number of tumors which are high on the mortality list in Sweden and globally. And they do not, uh, they receive very little research. Even lung cancer, which is number nine here and on the top 12 list, as you saw globally, it's one of the most important cancers. Is it really fair that we give seven times as much money to lung cancer? Uh, sorry, to breast as we do to lung cancer. In other countries, it looks similarly. In certain countries, it's a little bit better, like in the US. England is very good. They have. The, the Cancer Research UK gives uh, has lung cancer as number one here. We have tried in Sweden to uh, do things about this. Normally we take in, in open calls and we uh, do not allocate specifically money to certain cancer types. We just give out the money to the best research. And the reason it looks like this is because the best research is done in these other disciplines. So what you, can you do about that? We don't want to pour money over bad cancer research. We have tried to stimulate lung cancer and pancreas cancer uh, in different uh, campaigns by doing small measures, organizing conferences, giving feedback to researchers, etc. And if you follow the development from 2013, you can see that lung cancer has doubled uh, during the last seven years, and uh, pancreas cancer has gone up by a factor of five. So you can influence, by small measures, the fundings and direct it towards certain cancer types. Finally, I would just like to make one point here, and that is <coughs> mortality is going down. Is it going down in all the groups in society in an equal manner? And that's not so. So here we're looking at age standardized mortality, 100,000 in the population between 30 
or from 30 years. And uh, you can see here that women, for example, who have a longer education, they survive better and better, but in the other two groups, it is not so. There's a printing error here, it says post-college, college or pre-college, it should be high school, not college. But even within the country, it's so that the increased knowledge that we have is not uh, implemented in such a way that all socioeconomic groups benefit from it in an equal way. And that's an interesting problem to discuss. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Do we have any, well, do we have any comments or uh, sh short comments or questions from the audience? Where are the microphones? There's one. Okay, so let's start here. And then we have one gentleman on the left-hand side. Yes, please. Hello, my name is Kelechi Eguzome, Nigerian and a UICC young leader. My question is regarding, um, thank, thank you very much for your presentation. I do a lot of research so I can relate to what you're saying. But from what Dr. Parkin presented earlier, you could see that the volume of research done in developing countries is quite low compared to outside. So how much of your funding do you devote to, to research in the developing countries? So we found all the funding that we give out must be spent in Sweden. But the Swedish cancer researchers collaborate with the, uh, international colleagues in a wide variety of countries. So, in fact, we support indirectly research in many other countries. We have a specific rules that uh, we uh, do not allocate money according to the tumor types or whether they are common in Sweden or not. So you could not say, for example, in the Swedish research committee uh, under our guidance that will we'll not support this project, it's very good, but it's not really relevant to, to Swedish patients. I have been in at least one other European country in a committee where that argument was used explicitly. This is an interesting infection-related cancer, but we have so few cases of this in our country, so we won't support it. So we try to be really uh, fair uh, in, in that sense, if that was an answer to your question. One more short question, because we have to go on. Yes, please. Do you have a microphone? No. Hi, I'm Arun Gupta from Vinova Cancer India. Uh, my question is like in India, we have several agencies, several individuals, experts into treating cancer through alternate treatments, meaning Ayurveda and homeopathy. But unfortunately, very few institutions, in fact, I haven't seen any institution who's funding and research into alternate therapies for treatment of cancer. So do you support or do you have anything, anything of this sort in your planning? As I said, we don't allocate uh, money specifically uh, to any type of research, any type of cancer. If you are interested in an alternative method, and we can discuss how you should define alternative method, you're welcome to apply to us and the application will be evaluated, but on strict scientific grounds. Is this reasonable? Is, is the, the test of this new alternative treatment designed in a good way? If it is, it will be funded. But we have very, very few applications. I get many phone calls from people who have alternative treatments and say, why don't you support us? I say, we'll be glad to do that, just send in your application. Uh, but what should I write in the application? Well, you should write how you want to test uh, and show that your treatment works. And then they say, but I know that it works. I don't have to do that. They just want to support for, for treating more patients. And that's not really how we work as, uh, to fund research. Thank you very much, Klaus. Thank you.